Good morning and blessed Father's Day. This morning for Father's Day, something kind of neat is going on within our county, Christian congregations and preachers all over our county of different ethnicities, races, cultures, are all uniting to focus on the same text, which will serve as our first lesson for today. Are focusing on Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through, through 24. Now this is not the most popular or, or maybe most familiar book of the Bible in many circles, and, and there's probably good reason for that. Amos just rails on the disparity between the rich and the poor. Amos was writing at a time of relative peace and prosperity within the nation, uh, but what he had to say was not a very welcome message, especially if you were at the top or near the top of society, because he is just railing on those disparities between the rich and the poor and the lack of love, the lack of compassion that the rich have toward the poor. They're, they're lacking the Father's love towards them, their Father in Heaven's love toward them. And so Amos and the Father himself is calling for justice. Now, with everything going on in our country, we don't have the answers for everything that's going on, but we do have something to say about justice. We, we do have something to say at least uh, about biblical justice. Uh, the Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. It comes up a whole lot in the Minor Prophets, especially here in Amos. And, and it most often refers to a, this may bristle against our ears, but it, it often refers to what we could maybe call restorative justice. It, it's more than, it, it's not passive. It's more than just a, a feeling or being a good person. It, it's an activity. It, it's active. It, it's about searching and seeking out the most vulnerable people who are experiencing injustice or experiencing troubles and working to correct it, working to help them. It, it's advocating. It's giving voice to the oppressed, striving to change structures that foster oppression or injustice. We see this model to some extent throughout the life and ministry of Jesus as he goes to the oppressed, as he calls the marginalized, the suffering to himself, and as he confronts especially the structures within the church, as he confronts the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He protects the most vulnerable. As followers of Jesus, we seek to do the same. Uh, to practice mishpat, that active justice. We look for ways to restore the abused, to correct wrongdoing, to give voice to the oppressed, condemning the injustice or racism or, or prejudices, biases, wherever we see them. If we all matter to our Father in heaven, then we all ma ought to matter to one another, to each other. Jesus says, love your enemy. He even goes so far as calling our enemy our neighbor. Love your enemy. Love your neighbor. It, don't just go through the empty rituals and worship that people in Amos' day were doing. That's what, Jesus, that's what God the Father is condemning here. Bring proper worship to our Father by, by bringing it outside the walls of the church and extending our Father's generosity, His compassion, His love to all people. Hear the words now of Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. God says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals, by the way, who, which God instituted these religious festivals, but their hearts were no longer in the motivation behind them. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. This is a word of the Lord. By the way that justice most clearly rolls like a river flowing from Jesus's blood on the cross that has forgiven us for all the times that we have not, that we've gone through this empty ritualistic worship. 
Who do you relate the most to in the Bible? Have you ever thought about that before? Who do you relate to? What character in Scripture can you relate the most to? Maybe it's Moses and his lack of confidence and speaking in front of people. Or maybe, how about Martha in how busy she was busy in serving the Lord at times, but at times we see her busyness getting in the way of, of sitting down and listening to God's word. Maybe King David and his wandering eye, the peeping Tom and adulterous attitude and heart he displays. Maybe it's Elijah and how prone to depression he was. Or Joseph, his prison background. Maybe uh, John the Baptist and how he ate grasshoppers and, and slept under the stars. Okay, maybe not him. How about Paul, the Apostle Paul? Maybe it's not someone we relate to so much, but somebody we ought to strive, we want to relate to, but, but we can't when we see how many letters, 13 letters, 13 books of the Bible he wrote or started how many number of churches, uh, was a traveling missionary to how many churches, or his, his joy that he had and, and how he praised God, would sing hymns even in prison, as, even as he's in stocks. You know who could probably relate to Paul, though, when we see these words in the, first, in the second lesson from 1 Timothy? It's probably a, a terrorist, somebody who terrorizes the church could certainly relate to Paul or formerly known as Saul because Saul was a terrorist. He terrorized the early Christian church. You remember how how badly Jesus was treated and, and what was said about him in the Sanhedrin. That's what Paul was saying uh, about the Christians before he met Jesus on the way to Damascus, chasing after refugee Christians. Okay, he loved nothing more than blowing up Christian families, separating them, it, seeing Christians stoned to death, just as he was there at, at Stephen's martyrdom, at Stephen's death. That's why Paul calls himself in 1 Timothy the worst of sinners. Now, normally, we don't like to admit to our skeletons, to our sins, to our sinful identity. It, it's much more comfortable to say, look at that sinner over there. Look, can you believe what that person has done? But Paul clearly understood that when we're standing before God, he's not comparing us to anyone else in this world. We're going to see that in the gospel for today. When sinners go to Jesus and they're self-righteous, pointing out the sins of others, it, Jesus is going to leave them walking away as a sinner. Now, when sinners come to Jesus, we see who know that they're sinners, call themselves by their true identity, the worst of sinners, Lord, have mercy on me. How do they leave Jesus? They leave Jesus forgiven. Okay, Jesus came not for the healthy, but for the sick. For the sick sinners, that no one can take away Jesus' promises to forgive. The fact that when God is looking at you, poor sinner, he's not comparing you to other, anyone else other than Jesus, except it's not a comparison. It's a substitution. It, that's a promise you have, that Jesus is your substitute who came for you, you sick sinner, to forgive you, to give you a new identity as saints. And so when sinners now come before Jesus, they leave as saints. When people go to Jesus as saints, claiming on their own that they're so good, they're going to leave as sinners. How, how do you come before Jesus? Hear these words now from the second lesson from 1 Timothy, Paul's letter to young Pastor Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save 
sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of our Lord. Okay, the gospel appointed for today comes at the most opportune time. The gospel reading appointed for this Sunday is Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And this is a text that we all need to hear. I'm going to read it in just a few moments. I'd like to introduce it first. So sometimes when Karen and I are looking to relax at the end of the day, we'll turn on the TV. And sometimes... This is not a good way to relax, especially right now, but sometimes we'll turn on the news. And it's not really news so much. It's not at least firsthand news events, but most of the time it's commentary or it's a commentator's lens on the events. And so normally, typically what we're watching and what we're hearing is a person or a group of people's commentary on the news events. And I don't know if... Um, this is unique to our television, but at, at least on Sling TV, for us, we have these two channels that are right alongside one another. You have CNN and, and we have Fox News that are, are right next to one another. And so sometimes, oftentimes, if we're watching the news, we'll, we'll flip back and forth between the two. And it's a really interesting exercise. It's really interesting because um, the commentaries coming from the two channels couldn't be uh, more different at times. They, they're in uh, opposition to one another over some of the same events that they're commentating on. So it's striking just how different they can be. Uh, but what's also very interesting, what's also very striking, uh, maybe it's a little more difficult if you're not accustomed to it, but is looking for the similarities between the two. Uh, namely, I'm talking about the outrage, right? Uh, the outrage that is expressed, or the the tribalism, the name-calling, and the self-righteousness coming from the commentators. Can you believe what the other side is doing? Don't you support black lives? Don't black lives matter to you? Don't you understand what police officers are going through? Don't you appreciate the, the... blue lives, the the sheriff deputies that are serving our communities, you're a racist (laughs) or you're a communist. They they couldn't be more opposing and yet the similarities in the outrage or in the self-righteousness, the the looking and and seeking to alienate rather than seeking for understanding or, or for educating one another. Okay, a week and a half ago, we were watching a bit of Fox News and Tucker Carlson, who's, who has a, at least appears to have a, a pretty elevated um, blood pressure going through most of his commentary. In, in the middle of one of these monologues, he said something that was very revealing. And I, I, I don't know how sincere he was about this. And I haven't looked to see if he, he has corrected this because he is a Christian, but he he denied, in the middle of his commentary, denied the Christian doctrine of original sin. Said it would be crazy for anyone to believe that, that a child could be born evil, could be born into sin. Okay, and, and you take that to its conclusion, and it becomes really easy to understand uh, the self-righteousness, where self-righteousness can flow from that when it's you who've made bad choices and, and I've made the good choices. I've, I've stayed in my innocent, my good ways, and, and this person, this group has, has made these evil choices. It's, it's easy to see where that self-righteousness can come from. And I would argue that that same foundation is coming when you flip the channels. That same self-righteousness can be flowing from that same foundation, the denial, the 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 humility that comes from understanding that doctrine of original sin. 
Okay, so which side are, are you on? Do black lives matter? Do blue lives matter? Which tribe are you in? Or, or do we need to unite, rather, and, and find someone else to hate? A Bolton? <laughs> Michael Bolton? John Bolton? I, I've got a good one. An age-old one. How about the IRS? The tax man. That's someone we can all get behind hating, disliking, right? Until we see Jesus here in Matthew chapter 9 reaching out to the tax man. Now, it's, it's easy to understand the prejudice uh, against tax collectors in, in a way that, that's a little more difficult as 21st century uh, folks, it, it's a little more difficult to understand the, the prejudices of Jesus' time toward Galileans or toward Samaritans or to the, the Roman governing the occupation force that, that was in Israel at this time. It, it's a lot easier to understand the prejudice, the hatred toward uh, tax collectors at this time, which Matthew was a tax collector. Okay, how, how many of you do you love the IRS? Do you have April 15th circled with, with a heart around it, or in this case, July 15th? Are you looking forward to July 15th when, if you haven't done so already, when you, you get to hand over your, the 2019 money you might still owe over to the tax man? Okay, it's easy to understand the dislike for the tax man, and it's actually a lesser to greater argument when we go back to the prejudice and the anger, the hatred towards tax collectors in Jesus' time because they were traitors. Here they were. Here was a Jewish man working for the Roman authorities, the oppositional force. Here he had jumped tribes and was working for the Romans, and not only working for the Romans, but was out uh, to, to make money off of you. He'd get his orders from Rome, and, and then there were different, certainly different types of tax collectors, but uh, the same would hold true for, for many of them. You'd use some interesting math. You'd work the math and take advantage of the people you were taxing for one's personal gain. So a lot of reasons to dislike the tax man at that time. One, people don't generally don't like handing their money over to begin with. People especially don't like handing their money over to an occupational force um, in their country, that, that it's not going to their country, it's going uh, across the Mediterranean Sea to Rome. They certainly don't like giving their money away to a fellow Jew who is now a traitor, an Uncle Tom. Just think of all the names that people had for Matthew. You, you got to feel a little bit for the guy as much as you want to hate the tax man uh, just think of how hard that existence would be the call outs we we're accustomed we we know what a call out culture is and that's something we don't want to be a part of right we don't want to be called out uh, we don't our our mantra might be i i kneel i i bow down to no one okay we'll call it for what it is it's that self-righteousness to and here we see Matthew called out. He's called out by Jesus. Did you notice that? He's called out by the worst possible name he could be called. Jesus calls him a sinner. When it comes to Jesus, we need to be called out. There is a particular humility, a vulnerability we have as Christians because we recognize we're sick. God says, be holy, be perfect. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, who is my neighbor? Your neighbor is your enemy. See that Samaritan over there? That person that you're prejudiced against, whose history has, has opposed you all this time? Love that person. Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. When it comes to Jesus, we need to be called out. We need to be called out as sinners. We need to recognize we're sinners because it's not saints for whom Jesus came for. It is a sick. It is a sinner. 
that Jesus came walking in this world and yet was never overwhelmed by the sickness, never became sick by sin himself, went to the cross, and the ultimate weakness, the ultimate humility, the ultimate bowing down took place to suffer for all of our sins, to die for all of our sins. But then he did that third thing too. He rose again to give you a great physician, to give you a doctor, to heal you from all of your sins, and to instead give you not a hospital, but to give you heaven. Jesus came not for the holy. This church, our congregation, this is not, as St. Augustine is, is noted to have said, it's not a museum for the holy. It is a hospital for the sick. To, be, to point one another to Jesus, to point our community, our world, that desperately it needs to hear another way needs to see uh, another way, needs to see Jesus' love, our God's love, our God's compassion toward the suffering, to the sin sick. So he did something about it. He sent his one and only son. On this Father's Day, look to that Father. Look to that Father's love. Look how much you matter to that Father. Hear the words of Jesus now from the gospel appointed for today from Matthew chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a, a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the gospel of the Lord. By the way, that sinner, Matthew, his name isn't sinner. We know him by Matthew. That name, Matthew, means gift from God. You also, in Jesus, have been given the same gift from God, forgiveness from every one of your sins. Next week, we're going to look at more how we share that forgiveness, how we lead with compassion and mercy, sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus' forgiveness to all the world. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless all earthly fathers as they seek to fulfill the calling you have entrusted to them. Give them loving hearts and sound judgment to exercise godly family leadership. May they daily take to heart your admonition to not to discourage or embitter their children by treating them harshly or unfairly. Help them instead to bring up their children in training and instruction of the Lord. In loving Christian fathers, may children see reflections of you the Father whose love is perfect and complete. O Lord of God, Lord of life and death, we also bring this before you. We thank you for all the mercies with which you have blessed our fellow believer, our sister in Christ, Ann Hoyer, who is now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought Ann to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her husband, Phil, her sister Mary and all her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises. Cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last together with us all a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ our risen and everlasting Lord. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.